Take you live now in Washington, D.C. to remarks by Vermont Senator and former Democratic presidential candidate Bernie Sanders. He'll be discussing nationalism and authoritarianism at Johns Hopkins University. And uh, introductions underway. In the United States. The span and breadth of his career serve as an example to all of us who are interested in making a difference in the world. Senator Sanders, it's our privilege to host you. Please join me at the stage at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all very much for coming out this morning in DNASA. Uh, thank you very much for your kind introduction. And uh, Johns Hopkins University, thanks very much for allowing me uh, to be with you uh, today. Uh, as I think all of you know, uh, in the United States, politicians and the media pay a whole lot of attention to issues impacting our economy, health care, education, environment, criminal justice, immigration, and as we have recently seen, Supreme Court nominees. And all of these issues are obviously of enormous import. However, with the exception of immediate and dramatic crises, by and large, foreign policy is not something that usually gets a whole lot of attention or debate. In fact, there are some political analysts who have suggested that by and large, in terms of foreign policy, unlike domestic policy, in terms of foreign policy, we have a one party, one party foreign policy where the basic elements of our approach toward global affairs are not often debated or, in fact, challenged. In our country today, we are spending about $700 billion a year on the military, more than the next 10 nations combined, and many of those nations are our allies. We have been at war in Afghanistan for 17 years, been at war in Iraq for 15 years. We are currently involved militarily in Yemen, where a humanitarian crisis is taking place, a war, just to, pay, just to mention, that was not authorized by the United States Congress. Meanwhile, in the midst of massive military spending, in the midst of a war that was not authorized, 30 million people in our country have no health insurance. Tens of millions of people are living in dire poverty. We have an infrastructure of roads and bridges and water systems that are collapsing, and hundreds of thousands of bright young people in Vermont and throughout this country are unable to afford to go to college. Seems to me that the time is long overdue, not only for a serious discussion about our foreign policy, but about our national priorities in general. Today, I want to touch upon one trend, just one, trend in global affairs that in this country at least gets far too little attention. And that is that there is currently a struggle of enormous consequence taking place in the United States and throughout the world. In it, we see two competing visions for the future. On one hand, we see a growing worldwide movement toward authoritarianism, toward oligarchy, 
and kleptocracy. On the other hand, we see a growing movement toward strengthening democracy, toward respecting diversity, toward fighting for egalitarianism and for economic, social, racial, and environmental justice. This struggle has consequences for the entire future of the planet, economically, socially, and when we speak about climate change, environmentally. In terms of the global economy, I ask you to take a look with me where we are today in terms of the global economy. Today, we see massive and growing income and wealth inequality, where the world's top 1% now owns more wealth than the bottom 99%. 1%, 99%. Where a small number of huge Wall Street and international financial institutions exert enormous impact over the lives of billions of people in countries throughout the world. Further and importantly, many people in industrialized countries are questioning whether democracy can actually deliver for them. They look at their lives, they look at what is going on in their families, and they find themselves working longer hours for lower wages than they used to. They're falling further and further behind economically. In countries around the world, certainly in the United States, they see big money billionaires buying elections, and they see a political and economic elite growing wealthier, even as their own children's future grow dimmer. In fact, in the United States, for the first time in the modern history of our country, our younger generation stands a good chance of having a lower standard of living than their parents. In these countries, we often have political leaders who exploit these fears of economic insecurity by amplifying resentments, stoking intolerance, and fanning ethnic and racial hatreds among those people who are struggling. We see this very clearly in our own country, where it is coming from the highest level of our government. But it should be clear by now that Donald Trump and the right-wing movement that supports him is not a phenomenon unique to the United States. All around the world, in Europe, in Russia, in the Middle East, in Asia, Latin America, and elsewhere, we are seeing movements led by demagogues who exploit people's fears, prejudices, and grievances to gain and hold on to power. Just this past weekend, in Brazil's presidential election, right-wing leader Jair Bolsonaro, who has been called the Donald Trump of Brazil, made a very strong showing in the first round of voting, coming up just short of the 50% he needed for victory. Bolsonaro has a long record of attacks against immigrants, minorities, women, against LGBT people. Bolsonaro, who has said he loves Donald Trump, has praised Brazil's former military dictatorship and has said, among other things, that in order to deal with crime, police should simply be allowed to shoot more criminals. This is the person who may soon lead the world's fifth most populous country 
and its ninth largest economy. Meanwhile, at the same time, Brazil's most popular politician, former President Lula da Salva, is imprisoned on highly questionable <clears throat> charges and prevented from running again despite polls that showed that he was in first place. Bolsonaro in Brazil is one example. There are others which I will discuss. But I think it's important that we understand that what we are seeing now in the world is the rise of a new authoritarian axis. While the leaders who make up this axis may differ in some respects, they share key attributes, intolerance toward ethnic and religious minorities, hostility toward democratic norms, antagonism toward a free media, constant paranoia about foreign plots, and a belief that the leaders of government should be able to use their positions of power to serve their own selfish financial interest, i.e. kleptocracy. Interestingly, many of these leaders are deeply connected to a network of multi-billionaire oligarchs who see the world as their economic plaything. Those of us who believe in democracy, who believe that a government must be accountable to its people and not the other way around, must understand the scope of this challenge if we are going to confront it effectively. We need to counter oligarchic authoritarianism with a strong progressive movement that speaks to the needs of working people, that recognizes importantly that many of the problems we are faced with are the product of a failed status quo. We need a movement that unites people all over the world who don't just seek a return to a romanticized past, a past that did not work for so many, but who strive for something very different and much better. While this authoritarian trend certainly did not begin with Donald Trump, there is no question that other authoritarian leaders around the world have drawn inspiration from the fact that the president of the world's oldest and most powerful democracy is shattering democratic norms, is viciously attacking an independent media and an independent judiciary, and is scapegoating the weakest and most vulnerable members of our society. Just as an example, Saudi Arabia is a country, in my view, clearly in recent years inspired by Trump. Saudi Arabia, let us not forget, is a despotic dictatorship that does not tolerate dissent, that treats women as third-class citizens, and has spent the last several decades exporting an extremist form of Islam to countries around the world. Saudi Arabia is currently devastating the impoverished country of Yemen in a catastrophic war in alliance with the United States. And by the way, while we talk about Saudi Arabia, I would like to take a moment to note the disappearance of Saudi journalist Jamal Khashoggi, a critic of the Saudi government who was last seen entering the Saudi consulate in Istanbul, Turkey, last Tuesday. Over the weekend, Turkish authorities told reporters that they now believe Khashoggi was murdered in the Saudi consulate, 
murdered in a consulate and that his body disposed of elsewhere. We need to know what happened here. If this is true, if the Saudi regime murdered, murdered a journalist critic in their own consulate, there must be accountability and there must be an unequivocal condemnation by the United States. But it seems clear that Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman feels emboldened by the Trump administration's unquestioning support. Further, it is hard to imagine, I want you to think about this for a moment, hard to imagine that a country like Saudi Arabia would have chosen to start a fight this past summer, you may recall, with Canada over a relatively mild human rights criticism if Mohammed bin Salman, who is very close with presidential son-in-law Jared Kushner, did not believe that the United States would stay silent on this human rights issue. Three years ago, short period of time, who would have imagined that the United States of America would refuse to take sides between Canada, our democratic neighbor and second largest trading partner, and Saudi Arabia on an issue of human rights? But that is exactly what occurred. It is also hard to imagine that Israel's Netanyahu government would have taken a number of steps, including passing the recent nation state law, which essentially codifies the second class status of Israel's non-Jewish citizens. Hard to imagine that they would have aggressively undermined the long-standing goal of a two-state solution. Hard to imagine that they <clears throat> hard to imagine that they would continue to ignore the horrific economic crisis that exists in Gaza if they were not confident <clears throat> that Trump would continue to support them. And then there is Trump's very cozy relationships with Russian President Vladimir Putin whose intervention in our 2016 presidential election, Trump still fails to acknowledge. We face an unprecedented situation of an American president, think about it for a moment, who for whatever reason refuses to acknowledge a major attack on American democracy and our way of life. Now, why is that? I'm not sure. I really don't know what the answer is. Perhaps he really doesn't understand what happened. Or perhaps he is under Russian influence because of compromising information they may have on him. Or, frighteningly, perhaps he is ultimately more sympathetic to Russia's strongman form of government than he is to American democracy even as he draws closer to authoritarian leaders like Putin, like Orban in Hungary, Erdogan in Turkey, Duterte in the Philippines, and North Korea's Kim Jong-un, Trump is needlessly, at the same time, increasing tensions with our democratic European allies over issues like trade, like NATO, like the Iran nuclear agreement. Now, let me be clear, those are all important issues. But the way Trump has gratuitously disrespected our longtime allies is not only ineffective deal-making, it will have an enormous and negative long-term consequence for the transatlantic alliance. Further. I want you to hear this. Didn't get a whole lot of attention. Trump's ambassador to Germany, Richard Grinnell, 
several months ago made clear the administration's support for right-wing extremist parties across Europe. In other words, the U.S. administration is openly siding with the very forces that challenge the democratic foundations of our longtime European allies. Now, we need to understand that the struggle for democracy is bound up with the struggle against kleptocracy and corruption. That is true here in the United States as well as abroad. In addition to Trump's hostility toward democratic institutions here in the United States, we have a billionaire president who, according to a recent report in the New York Times, acquired his wealth through illegal means, and now, as president, in an unprecedented way, has blatantly embedded his own economic interests and those of his cronies into the policies of government. One of the consistent themes of reports coming out of the investigation into the Trump campaign is the effort of wealthy foreign interests seeking influence and access with Trump and his organization and with close Trump associates seeking to trade their access for the promise of even more wealth. While the characters involved in these reports are particularly blatant and clumsy in their efforts, the details of these stories are not unique. Never before in our nation's history have we seen the power of big money over governmental policy so clearly. Now, we kind of take it for granted, but it is important that we understand what is going on. Whether we're talking about the Koch brothers spending hundreds of millions of dollars to dismantle environmental regulations that protect Americans' health, or authoritarian monarchies like Saudi Arabia, the UAE, and Qatar spending millions in fossil fuel wealth in Washington, right here, to advance the interest of their undemocratic regimes, or giant corporations supporting think tanks in order to produce policy recommendations that serve their own financial interests, the theme is the same. Powerful special interests use their wealth to influence government for their own selfish interests. During the congressional fight over the Republicans' massive tax giveaway to the wealthy, what some people call tax reform, Some of my colleagues were extremely open about exactly what was going on. Senator Lindsey Graham of South Carolina, he was very frank about it. If Republicans failed to pass this $1 trillion tax break for the rich, top rich, top 1%, and private, large, profitable corporations, Graham said, and I quote, the financial contributions will stop, end quote. This, he went on, quote, will be the end of us as a party, end quote. Well, I don't agree with Lindsey Graham on much, but I do applaud his honesty. <laughs> this corruption is so blatant, it's no longer seen as remarkable. We take it for granted. Just the other day, the lead sentence in a New York, New York Times story about Republican megadonor Sheldon Adelson was this, quote, this is Sheldon Adelson, contributes huge amounts of money to the Republican Party, quote, the return on investment for many of the Republican Party's biggest political patrons has been less than impressive this year, end quote. <laughs> it's not talking about his investment in Amazon, or General Electric, that was his investment in the Republican Party. Return on investment, 
less than impressive this year. The idea that political donors expect a specific policy result in exchange for their campaign contributions, a like quid pro quo, is the definition of corruption. It is right now absolutely out there in the open. It is no longer even seen as, as scandalous. It is something that we take for granted. This sort of corruption is common. We are going to leave Senator Sanders' remarks for a moment, take you live to the U.S. House, meeting for a brief pro forma session. We'll bring you back to uh, the S School of Advanced International Studies shortly. House will be in order. The chair lays before the House a communication from the Speaker. The Speaker's Rooms, Washington, D.C., October 9th, 2018. I hereby appoint the Honorable Alexander X. Mooney to act as Speaker pro tempore on this day. Signed, Paul D. Ryan, Speaker of the House of Representatives. The prayer will be offered by our House Chaplain, Father Conroy. Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for giving us another day. In this moment of prayer, please grant to the members of this People's House, as they meet with their respective constituents during this campaign season, the gifts of wisdom and discernment that in their words and actions, they will do justice, love with mercy, and walk humbly with you. We ask your special blessing upon those on the Gulf Coast who are facing yet another major storm. In the coming days, protect all from severe harm and empower those first responders to render the assistance that will be needed. May all that is done this day be for your greater honor and glory. Amen. Amen. Pursuant to Section 4A of House Resolution 1084, the Journal of the Last Day's Proceedings is approved. The Chair will lead the House in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The chair lays before the House a communication. The Honorable the Speaker, House of Representatives, Sir, pursuant to the permission granted in Clause 2H of Rule 2 of the Rules of the U.S. House of Representatives, the clerk received the following message from the Secretary of the Senate on October 5, 2018, at 10.39 a.m., that the Senate passed Senate 440, that the Senate passed Senate 995, that the Senate passed Senate 2074. With best wishes, I am, signed sincerely, Karen L. Haas. Pursuant to Section 4B of House Resolution 1084, the House stands adjourned until 9.30 a.m. on Friday, October 12, 2018. The House is meeting every few days this month for pro forma sessions since the Senate is in session. Legislative work in the House resumes after the midterm elections, Tuesday, November 13th. Back now to remarks by Senator Bernie Sanders on the current political climate. Not to accept massive levels of income and wealth inequality where the top 1% of the world's population owns half the planet's wealth while the bottom 70% of working age population account for less than 3% of global wealth. It is not to accept a declining standard of living for many workers around the world, nor to accept a reality 
of 1.4 billion people today living in extreme poverty, where children in country after country today are dying from easily preventable illnesses. Our job is to fight for a future in which public policy and new technology and new innovation work to benefit all of the people, not just the elite few. Our job is to support governments around the world that will end the absurdity of the rich and multinational corporations stashing over $21 trillion into offshore bank accounts, Cayman Islands and elsewhere, to avoid paying their fair share of taxes. $21 trillion stashed in tax havens around the world. And meanwhile, the respective governments go before their people and say, we don't have enough money and we need to impose an austerity budget on you. Our job is to rally the entire planet to stand up to the fossil fuel industry, which continues to make huge profits while their carbon emissions destroy the planet for our children, our grandchildren, and future generations. The scientific community is virtually unanimous in telling us that climate change is real, climate change is caused by human activity, and climate change is already causing devastating harm in the United States and throughout the world. Further, what the scientists tell us is if we do not act boldly to address the climate crisis, this planet will see more drought, more floods, more extreme weather disturbances, more acidification of the oceans, more rising sea levels, and as a result of mass migrations, <clears throat> there will be more threats to global stability and security. A new report from the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, released just the other day, warns that we only have about 12 years to take urgent and unprecedented action to prevent the rise in the planet's temperature that would cause irreversible, irreversible damage. The threat of climate change is a very clear example of where American leadership can make a difference in the world. Imagine if we had a president who not only did not think that climate change was a hoax, but was pushing policies every day that make a bad situation even worse. The truth is that Europe cannot address climate change by itself, although some of the countries there are doing a very good job in trying to transform their energy systems. China can't do it alone, although they are making some important efforts. And the United States can't do it alone. This is a crisis that calls out for strong international cooperation if we are to leave this planet in a way that is healthy and habitable for future generations. In the struggle to preserve and expand democracy, our job is to fight back against the coordinated effort strongly supported by the president and funded by oligarchs like the Koch brothers to make it harder for American citizens to vote. So not only in the struggle for democracy here do we have to take on a corrupt campaign finance system, we have to take on a very coordinated effort in voter suppression, which is making it harder for poor people and people of color to vote. Our job is to push for trade policies that don't just benefit 
multinational corporations and hurt working people throughout the world as they are written out of public view. Our job is to fight back against brutal immigration policies that will require separating migrant families when they are detained at the border and require children to be put in cages. Our job is to make sure that we commit more resources to taking care of people than we do on weapons designed to kill them. It is not acceptable that with the Cold War long behind us, countries around the world spend well over a trillion dollars a year on weapons of destruction while so many suffer in dire poverty. Let us remember what President Dwight D. Eisenhower said, and please remember that Dwight D. Eisenhower, hard to believe, was not a radical socialist, he was a Republican. <laughs> and this is what Eisenhower said in 1953, just a few months, few months after he took office. And remember, this was a four-star general who led American armed forces in World War II. Let us never forget what he said, quote, Every gun that is made, every warship launched, every rocket fired, signifies in the final sense a theft from those who hunger and are not fed, those who are cold and are not clothed. This world in arms is not spending money alone. It is spending the sweat of its laborers, the genius of its scientists, the hopes of its children, end quote. And just as he was about to leave office in 1961, after eight years, Eisenhower was so concerned about the growing power, power of the weapons industry that he issued this warning, quote, in the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist, end of quote. We have seen that potential more than fulfilled over the past decades. It is time for us to stand up and say, there is a better way to use our wealth. In closing, let me simply state that in order to effectively combat the forces of global oligarchy and authoritarianism, we need an international movement that mobilizes behind a vision of shared prosperity, security, and dignity for all people, and that addresses the massive global inequality that exists not only in wealth, but in political power. Such a movement must be willing to think creatively and boldly about the world that we would like to see. In other words, think big. What kind of world do you want to see? While the authoritarian axis is committed to tearing down a post-World War II global order that they see as limiting their access to power and wealth, it is not good enough for us to simply defend that order as it exists. We must look honestly at how that order has failed to deliver on many of its promises and how authoritarians have adeptly exploited those failures in order to build support for their agenda. We must take the opportunity to reconceptualize a global order based on human solidarity, based on the understanding that it's not me against you or the United States against China, but that we as a world, especially with the threat of climate change, are in it together. That in many ways, we are going to survive by working together, or we're going to go down by the kinds of divisions that the authoritarians are trying to create. We need a new order that recognizes that every person on this <clears throat> on this planet 
shares a common humanity, that we all want our children to grow up healthy, to have a good education, to have decent jobs, to drink clean water, to breathe clean air, and to live in peace. Our job is to reach out to those in every corner of the world who share these values and who are fighting with us for a better world. Authoritarians seek power by promoting division and hatred. We will promote unity, inclusion, and love. In time of exploding wealth and technology, we have on this planet the potential to create a decent life for all people. Our job is to build on our common humanity and to do everything that we can to oppose all of the forces, whether unaccountable government power or unaccountable corporate power, who try to divide us up based on the color of our skin, the country we were born in, our religion, our sexual orientation, our gender, who try to divide us up in every way possible and to set us each against each other. We know that those forces are working today across national borders. We must do the same and create an international progressive community that stands for social, economic, racial, and religious justice for all. Thank you very much.